Okay, it's two o'clock, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to our first extended REACH series, webinar series. Um, we wanna welcome you. The Carlisle Illinois College of Medicine wants to welcome you. Um, for those that are not familiar with REACH, um, that stands for Research and Education for the Advancement of Compassionate Healthcare. And it is one of our pathway programs here at Carl, Illinois, um, that is typically in the summer. Um, this year, um, we are pivoting and offering um, this webinar series virtually um, to people um, all over the nation. So we hope you find this informative. Our REACH program um, is intended to help students that are interested in medical school um, gain opportunities um, to prepare for um, medical school itself through research and clinical shadowing opportunities, as well as workshops, seminars, professional development. Um, so we're hoping that these virtual sessions will help you um, work towards your journey to medical school and professional development of that. Um, today, our speaker is Dr. Ruby Mendenhall. She is the Assistant Dean for Diversity and Democratization of Health Innovation at the Carl Illinois College of Medicine. She is also an Associate Professor of Sociology, African American Studies, Urban and Regional Planning, Gender and Women's Studies, and Social Work at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. She's affiliate of the Carl Woos Institute for Genomic Biology, Women and Gender and Global Perspectives, the Klein Center for Advanced Social Research, Epstein Health Law and Policy Program, Family Law and Policy Program, and the Institute for Computing and Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences. Dr. Mendenhall's research examines how living in racially segregated neighborhoods with high levels of violence affects Black mothers' mental and physical health using surveys, interviews, crime statistics, police records, data from 911 calls, art, wearable sensors, and genomic analysis. She examines the role of the earned income tax credits in social mobility and health outcomes and the medicalization of poverty. She is interested in how families use their <clears throat> earned income tax credit to secure affordable and safe housing. She studies the effects of race, racial microaggressions on students of color, health, and sense of belonging are predominant on predominantly white campuses. She also employs big data to recover black women's lost history using topic modeling and data visualization to examine over 800,000 documents from 1740 to 2014. So welcome Dr. Mendenhall. if you wanna go ahead and get started. Thank you. Uh, welcome everybody. We are excited to have you here and to um, let you know some of the things that we're doing. So the way I, I hope this goes is that I will talk for about 25, um, 35 minutes and Lisa will um, give me like a five minute warning. So then I'll start to wrap up. And if I go fast past something like um, feel free to put um, a question in the chat. I told Lisa she can let me know. So even if I'm speaking, I can stop and answer questions. And then also at the end, we try to really save 25 minutes for questions and we'll um, set it up so that you can um, either put the questions in chat or even if you want us to hear your voice, um, that's good as well. So um, I titled the talk Designing Resiliency and Wellbeing because I'm really spending a lot of time um, these days, a, a lot, even before COVID-19, even before um, the social movement that we are all um, involved in. Um, to really think about how can you really democratize health? How can you let um, individuals who are in communities who may not be associated with colleges of medicine or universities design their own resiliency and well being? And even as I say that, right, um, people are doing it. And I'll talk a little bit about my own history um, and um, trying to understand. Um, what things as being part of a marginalized group in U.S. society, right? The things that have allowed us to um, survive and even to thrive, right? Like how do we bring those to the forefront and kind of think about um, scaling them up? Okay. 
uh, Oli said it worked perfectly when we were testing it. Okay. Help you out. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so um, before I start, um, I want to say thank you more than words can say to our essential um, workers um, and um, the life-saving work that they do from um, cleaning facilities to um, picking our food that's on the plate and then of course to caring for our loved ones. So a big thank you. Um, so just in general, my outline, um, a little bit about my journey, right? I think that's important. Um, it's always important to kind of see the paths that people took because it's never really quite a straight path. Um, to say a little bit about current events, um, talk about health disparities, how it relates to my research, and then in terms of designing resiliency and well-being, thinking about STEM Illinois, um, the health maker lab that we have, and then as I said, um, 25 minutes for a Q&A. Okay. Hold on, let me see if I can move it. Oh, I can't, yeah. Um, so I want to acknowledge Girl Track, right? So they're doing um, a movement, another movement of sorts in terms of saying the Daughters of campaign. And so I just want to um, acknowledge that and say I'm the daughter of Polly Marshall, who was enslaved, the great granddaughter of Frances Marshall, who was also enslaved, um, um, the great granddaughter Rosa Jackson, the granddaughter of Mary Frances Isom, and um, the daughter of Ruby Mendenhall on my father's side, and then on my mother's side, the great granddaughter of Dora Jameson, and then the granddaughter of Marie Jameson. And those are um, just some women when I talk about um, resiliency and designing it and what does that look like. Um, I'll just talk briefly about two examples. Um, one of them is a story that I heard about my great great grandmother who was a slave and that she would um, sneak out of the cabin and then um, go by the fire to stay warm. And I think it's interesting because in my house, right, I'm always the one like I carry um, a little heater with me because usually I'm always cold and my son um, always has fans on him, right? Because he, he gets hot a lot. So just kind of, I think about her and um, how comfortable I would, would not be if I wasn't able to have a heater close by. And then these images, um, this one with Dr. King, my grandmother is at this event um, and my cousin is here. Um, he has a, hanker, um, a towel on his head and then this is my great aunt. And also just to hear their stories um, about how they survived Jim, Jim Crow South. And even as my grandmother is at this meeting with Dr. King, this was a very dangerous thing to do because um, the reason he's outside is that there was a threat of a bomb. The meeting was initially scheduled to be inside. And so I just want to acknowledge, um, again, this idea of resiliency, of well-being, that many marginalized groups is in our culture, right? It's things that have been passed down. But again, thinking about how we bring those up to the forefront. Um, so my life course, right? So I'll give you just a little bit about the path that I took to get here to the College of Medicine. Um, when I was, I think maybe in high school, I um, saw TV um, news clips about um, starvation in Somalia. And I always remembered that I wanted to be a physician and I wanted to um, go and work with um, issues around food and famine. And I remember I told my mom one day and uh, she, she just kind of had this look and she was like, you have to go all the way to Africa. And so um, I don't know. So, so something clicked there, um, but I did stay in the um, health profession. I worked as a pediatric occupational therapist um, at then Cook County Hospital. And I loved, loved that job. I loved working with um, young people and their families. Um, but I was also on the protective service team. And so we had lots of children who were failing to thrive. And that means they weren't growing like they should for their age. And so um, as part of the health uh, protective service team, right, we would look at the mothers or parents and um, insinuate like, okay, are you good parents? What's happening that the baby isn't growing? And a lot of the parents, um, they were, I, I distinctly remember a lot of them were black women, um, Latinx women. And they would talk about the baby wasn't growing because they didn't have enough money 
to um, by the formula. So they were watering down the formula. And I remember thinking, okay, this isn't an issue with the mothers or the parents, if they're um, good parents or not. This is an issue about society and um, putting resources into feeding people. And so I became interested in public policy. I went to the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago. And then when I got out, um, finished two years later, I went to the Ounce of Prevention Fund Kids um, Policy and Public Education Project. And so there, um, worked as a lobbyist, um, worked with legislators around um, child welfare, around welf um, welfare reform issues, um, or welfare issues, I, I should say. And then um, I remember, though, as I sat in the meetings that uh, most of the um, individuals at the meetings were white men, and they were passionate about the issues that were going on. But I remember thinking, well, where are the um, mothers? Where are the people who are experiencing it? Why aren't they around the table trying to think about what the policy should look like? So I'm always interested in that. And that's um, one of the things that drive a lot of what we do here around democratization of health innovation. So I went to school, uh, PhD, Northwestern in Human Development and Social Policy. And I looked at how, um, um, how where you live, right, if you were in a black segregated neighborhood versus other neighborhoods, how that affected um, your economic outcome. And then as I started hearing about violence, I turned to researching that, that I'll talk about some more. So um, that's, that's one path, right, that brought me here to University of Illinois as an assistant professor. But then I also um, was given the great um, honor of having a year off from teaching and I studied in a second discipline and um, took um, genomic biology classes, endocrinology, um, worked a lot with Jean Robinson in terms of mentoring me in genomic biology. So my research um, kind of shifted and is looking at um, health outcomes, right? How the violence in Chicago affects Black mothers' mental and physical health. And then as Lisa says, I also work on uh, racial microaggressions. Can you do the next slide, Lisa? Yep. OK, thanks. And so um, now to current events, right? Um, I mean, a lot. This is, uh, um, I talk about it as a perfect storm. We have so much happening. Um, so we just, end of May, beginning of June, uh, commemorated the 99th year of the Tulsa, um, Oklahoma race massacre, where about 300 um, African Americans were killed. And, um, and it was a thriving business community, right? So that's 99 years. And then on top of that, we have the pandemic of COVID-19. And then we have um, what we talk about as a pandemic within the pandemic, where you have um, the population, this is in Chicago, right? The black population is about 30%, um, yet they were, um, and this was as of um, April 13th, right? So they were, about 39% of those positive for COVID-19, but about 68% of the deaths, right? So um, just really extraordinarily high numbers. And then we're learning more and more that other groups are also impacted um, disproportionately. Um, we had Brianna Taylor, who was shot eight times by police. And then also um, we saw on the news Ahmaud Aubrey while he was jogging, um, murdered. Um, and then George Floyd, which um, was right, so it was so much kind of um, fuel. And then that was a spark that I believe that um, just ignited this national um, protest, but also this international protest. Um, people from Brazil, from Jamaica, the Netherlands, just all over the world are um, saying that, that this is the time, this is the moment now and not just for uh, police reform, but just all of the, um, the oppression and the inequalities and the intersection of them that are happening. So then another in intersection in Chicago, um, May 2020, um, shootings were up 71% and murders were up 60%. So um, it's 400 years of um, Black racial trauma and, and or 401, I should say. And then just kind of this perfect storm that's really creating a setting where it's important to think about how to design resiliency and well-being. Next, Lisa. And so um, 
And I love this quote by Ella Baker, right? We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes for that part. And then also um, she says, the secret of my going on is when the reins are in the hands, should be hands of the young who dare to run against the storm. And again, that's part of what we're trying to do now is to um, create this pathway of young people who come forward, who will be in different spaces, who will um, play a role in this structural change that we talk about, even dismantling it. When we, um, to the corner, look at this mountain and you think about, um, it's so big, is it immovable? And sometimes I, I have my hand up, sometimes I feel like it is immovable, but then I think about um, slavery, right? I started talking about my ancestors who were enslaved, so I'm not um, living as a slave. I put a question mark by Jim Crow because um, some scholars are um, now saying that schools are more segregated than um, before Brown, right? So that's a question mark about Jim Crow. Um, and then also the idea of reparations and, um, and what that means now when you think about the 401 years of racial trauma. And it's really something to think about. Also had this image, 2014, right? So I was at a protest in DC. I was at the Department of Justice. Um, saying Black Lives Matter. This was, again, with Eric Garner, um, with the I can't breathe, and then to hear the same words, right? So you wonder, how, what, how do you move this mountain? How do you tear it down? But we argue um, you have some of the answers to that. So that's why we are um, just excited to support um, your efforts. Next, please. And so um, I talk about this slide usually around social determinants of health, but we can also think about it in terms of police involvement. Um, you think about what's at the tip of the iceberg, um, could be illness, it's disease, it could be police involvement. But Robert Wood Johnson um, was one of the, I believe, first um, organizations that really tried to shift how we thought about um, disease and where we put our monies. And they started um, this whole conversation around social determinants of health. Well, I don't know if they, I don't know if they started it, but they certainly um, expanded it and put it out there in the general public in ways that I hadn't seen before. And saying that um, those things are at the tip of the iceberg, but we have to pay attention to what's underneath, right? Um, the access to higher education, to quality K through 12 education, the neighborhood and the built environment. How does that um, foster health or not? Um, the community context, discrimination, um, economic insecurity, what we're seeing a lot of now is people um, are laid off or lose their jobs completely and the food insecurity that's associated with that. And so um, even when we think about police involvement, people are in residential, um, segregated neighborhoods, if there's hyper surveillance that's going on, um, looking to the why, why do we see it, why do we see it, getting to the root causes, excuse me, and then also um, thinking about funding and where you can put the money into, and as Robert Wood Johnson said, um, really thinking about putting funding into prevention, then that's how we also should think about with police involvement, right, to put um, some of the funding into prevention and wellness strategies, to designing resilient, resiliency and well-being, to the mental health workers. Sometimes there are police calls around that and to consider um, what kind of ecosystem could we create where who responds to calls around um, mental health um, issues and also economic development, the same around housing. And so um, there is a wonderful documentary is um, Unnatural Causes is Inequality Making Us Sick. And so um, so we all know the answer to that, um, especially with COVID-19, um, many of us um, understood it before. And David Satcher and colleagues, um, they did a study and they talked about um, that they found that there were 83,000 excess Black deaths a year, meaning that African Americans died more than what you would see from old age, more than what you would see from um, disease or illness. And they said that um, in the documentary that it was equal to a plane full of African Americans falling out the sky every day, every year. And so that was happening way before COVID-19. And then when COVID-19 hit, um, people could really see that process sped up, right, with the comorbidities and all those other things. 
And so Rodriguez and colleagues, um, they looked at data from 1970 to 2004, and they estimated that there were 2.7 million excess Black deaths, right? So these images I tried to um, say, right? So if the if it's a year, right, it's 365 days of a uh, plane falling out the sky. But if you look at it from 1970 to 2004, then imagine all of these planes falling out the sky um, with African Americans. And so that's part, and, and other groups too, right? We know the health disparities um, includes other groups. So again, to think about how do we interrupt that? How do we create systems that would um, decrease that? How do we push health equity? And so I, I talked some about this, right? So again, it's um, um, race, it's class, it's gender, it's the um, geographic area that you grow up in. Is it gun violence? Is it um, pollutants from um, industry, the employment status, um, sexuality, religion, ability status, age, skin color, right? The list can go on and on. And um, you really have to think about um, all of that in the context of COVID-19 and even um, the rebellions. It's, it's hard for me to turn on the news. And at some point, some points I get overwhelmed. Um, there are tears and I have to turn away from it. So um, we really have to think about um, what's happening on a large scale, right? To, to group to our marginalized, most effective, but I think on a large scale that, that almost everyone is untouched. And so um, I just want to play this clip from um, Is Inequality Making Us Sick? And um, Lisa, if you don't mind, can I just do a sure. time check? Yep. Wow. We have about um, 13 minutes. Okay, thanks. We had vast public investments in building the suburbs of America. Federally supported loans, FHA loans, went to people who were moving to the suburbs. And for many years, up until the 60s, those loans were available on a racially restricted basis. African Americans and other people of color didn't have access to them. Until 1962, out of $120 billion in government-backed home loans, less than 2% went to non-white households. In Northern California, between the war and 1960, of 350,000 federally guaranteed new home loans, less than 100 went to black families. In cities like Richmond, African Americans were left behind in increasingly neglected neighborhoods. In the 1980s, Poor Latino and Southeast Asian immigrants began joining them in these same neighborhoods. Once the community starts to go downhill, nobody wants to actually invest in the community, so the banks don't want to come in, and the shops don't want to come in. Then you don't have a commercial base, you don't have the community taxes that can then feed back into the schools. Now you don't have good schools, so families don't want to move into the community if they don't have to because you don't have good schools, and you get a sort of vicious cycle of everybody who can will leave the community. This isn't something that happens overnight, and it isn't the fault of the people who live there. The people who live in low-income, disinvested communities did not do this to themselves. 20 years before his heart attack, Kwai tried to move his family out of Richmond. But 11 months later, they had to move back. I can't find my job up there, and she can't find her job up there. And move back, my older son, you know, hang around with the wrong group and then use uh, some kind of drug. I just don't know what to do. I try to help him. I try to straighten him out, spend a lot of money, owe people a lot of money. That's what in my mind all the time. So it's worry, just worry, worry. When I'm, when I'm going to pay up all of this and how I'm going to do it. If you think about when you're worried, you know, you're always a little bit more activated. There's a little bit more vigilance. You're sort of checking things out a little bit more carefully. And if you can imagine that happening day after day, all day, every day, it's exhausting. And it wears on the body system. 
When stress is chronic, when we're endlessly worried about our bills, our job, our children's safety, the body pumps out cortisol and adrenaline. But too much of these stress hormones over time can increase arterial plaque, raise blood pressure, and weaken our immune system, increasing our risk for almost every chronic disease, including heart disease, the leading killer in America. We've done studies um, that have shown that living in disadvantaged neighborhoods is related to an increased risk. It's about 50 to 80 percent increase in, in risk of developing heart disease. And this has been replicated in other studies. All right, so um, really trying to um, understand those processes, but then also to try to interrupt them. And again, especially as we see um, now that we're dealing with um, COVID-19 and then disproportionate deaths for people of color and, um, and elderly. And then I'll skip this one. And then so moving to my research, um, so in um, the 60s, Michael Harrington wrote a book called The Other America, right? And he was trying to wake America up to the fact that there were still um, people inside this country that was um, experiencing a boom, experiencing a boom at the time. There were still people who were unable to um, feed themselves, who were really struggling, both um, whites in Appalachia, but then also um, African Americans, um, Latinx, and other groups in inner cities. And so um, fast forward to 2012, and then um, David Ford, who worked with ABC News, um, they started talking about this idea of a hidden America. And he talked about it as a place where um, people live and they're raising children with unfathomable um, levels of violence. And, and, um, and I'll, I'll talk about that because it's true. Like I, I research, um, I work with the mothers, but um, it, it is levels that's really hard to imagine. And you just saw the clip about what stress does to the body. And then to think about um, all that's happening with the mothers and fathers, it's not just about them, right? It's about the children and as parents, right? You do whatever you need to do to try to protect your children. So I'll talk a little bit about what some of the mothers say. I'm checking time, okay. Um, and then this slide is just about resiliency, right? So some of the um, things that I'll talk about is a little, um, it's, a, it's a lot rough, it's a lot difficult to talk about, but I always show this slide again to just kind of point to um, the resiliency in the Black community. And then also if you get a chance, um, please listen to Margaret Walker um, for my people, one of my favorite, favorite songs. And then in terms of methods, um, we did two. Lisa, is there a question that I should take now or should I take it later? Not right now. Okay. So um, we did two focus groups. I'm just trying to see if violence was an issue. And then we um, worked with about 96 mothers in Inglewood doing um, in-depth interview surveys, um, asking about depression symptoms, um, their coping. And then we also asked them for blood to do um, genomic analysis, right, to see how um, the stress, well, whether stress gets under the skin to affect their health and well-being. Uh, and just research questions, we wanted to know um, what they were experiencing and if it did affect their mental and physical health. And I'm going to speed up some a little bit now because I want to okay. definitely get to Dr. Mendenhall, we did just get one question. Uh -huh. um, what should we do to fix this systemic problem within Black America? especially as it affects every aspect of Black lives from financial to health issues? Yeah, I mean, great question. And I think that's what um, this whole movement, right? People are out on the streets marching to really change um, the system. So it, 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 I would argue um, it needs changing on all levels, um, health, education, um, employment. We talked about police practices. So um, um, policy, I mean, it's, it's different levels, so it's different answers. Um, one is to change policies, and there's lots of discussion around that on the individual level in terms of um, some of the things that we're trying to do with um, working with communities, um, building infrastructures in the College of Medicine where young people, especially um, young people from marginalized groups, can come to the College of Medicine. Um, 
the university has uh, free tuition for families, um, for students whose families make under the median income. I think that's a big game changer in terms of disman dismantling some of these systems. So we can talk about more about that um, in Q&A, but those are just some of the things. Okay, and then also a five minute time check. Okay, me. all right, so I'm gonna go very, very fast. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Next slide. Yes. Okay. Um, and this is just a slide of one of the mothers who just um, was grateful that we came out to talk with her and she pointed out the little things matter. So that, that last question about how do you change, I was thinking, okay, let's think about policy, let's think about systemic change, let's figure out how we're going to um, knock this mountain down. And she let me know that even when you do little things, when you sit and ask people, how are you? What do you need? Like, how can I help? that as she says, that makes a difference and people don't even understand that. Next, please. Um, this is um, a clip from a documentary. I won't show it since we just have five minutes, but you can Google what's left behind. And it's part of a documentary that we're doing with mothers who've lost adult children um, to gun violence. And that really spurred kind of me thinking about resiliency and well-being and, and what do you, how do you, support um, parents who, whose um, lives are just shattered at the death of their children. Next, please. Um, so just some of the things, when we talked to the mothers, they talked about um, having headaches, backaches, stomach, pain, stomach aches, hair falling out, panic attacks. One mother, she lost her, after she lost her son, couldn't taste food anymore, um, loss of sexual desire. But I also want to say, right, so here we're talking about low-income um, Black women living in segregated neighborhoods, right, with um, um, limited access to resources. But also when I do research on racial microaggressions and when I talk to Black women faculty, right, the stress of racism still plays out in our bodies in similar ways with the headaches, the backaches, the stomach aches, and um, other things. And I'll skip this because I want to go to the designing resilient coping. Um, they talked a lot about prayer. Um, one of the mothers said, um, if you pray, don't worry. And if you worry, don't pray. And I said, and does that help? And she said, yes. So I always like to keep that one. Um, let's keep going to the, um, oh, I want to stop with this one. So you saw with the, um, is inequality making us sick when they talked about how stress gets under the skin. So I'm working with two great um, medical students, they're helping me to um, publish a paper about the women um, who talked about trauma as children, trauma as adults, and then women who had trauma both as children and adults. And we're trying to, in the paper, talk about how um, it affects um, their health and well-being. So this is a, a wonderful um, image that they're working on now. And um, so now we're moving into kind of the designing resiliency and well-being, and it's part of the land grant mission. Keep going. And um, one part of that is STEM Illinois, and you can go to the next slide, which is an um, intergenerational um, pathway program. And um, we are working with many groups around the um, city, um, NAACP, we're working with churches, um, different schools to create, again, we talked about what can you do, right? Creating this infrastructure, this ecosystem that will support students and their parents as they um, try to, or no, not as they try, as they um, move through um, STEM fields and um, pathways. And we argue that the mother, the uncle, the brother, the sister, the cousin, needs to be in the pathway because it's so, it's so difficult, right? At the College of Medicine, we talk about that it's such an elite space at the um, intersection of engineering and medicine. And so we argue that you need everyone to um, help that young person get to that space. And I'm sure some of you are nodding your head and saying, yeah. And um, so um, we were going to have STEM Fest, which is large events. We're kind of waiting to see um, what will happen with that in terms of when um, people can start to gather again and practice practicing social distancing. But one thing we're working on um, with the NSF grant is to um, have young people fly drones and then also um, Keith Jacobs at Extension is working on a bold audacious idea of actually sending 
um, drone satellites into space. So we're hoping that we can um, develop that and the young people that we work with with this grant can play a role. Dr. Mendenhall, we do, we are at 25 minutes. So okay. I'll let you decide if you'd like to finish or if you'd like okay, to- Okay, so um, give me, give me like another four minute warning right. and then okay. we'll just go very, so we can skip okay. this one. This is just about helping students achieve their potential. Um, we have a hip hop express bus that Will Patterson um, is leading and in it, we're making it like a studio where um, young people can work with music, but then also they're learning different engineering um, tools, working with circuits and coding. Next, please. Um, Kenneth Hill in Chicago is part of STEM Illinois and he's working with um, young people and their parents on um, math and computer science. Next, please. Um, so we have a community university think and do tank where we um, really talk about working with citizen scientists. So individuals who work alongside um, um, social scientists, engineers, and others to design um, resiliency and well-being. Um, think and do tank, right? So we're, um, someone said, what do you do, right? We're really at a point in history where we have to dismantle um, the structural oppression in, in different ways. And um, many times we, we, you know, we have to sit and really think about what things will be long lasting, right? Because we've had slavery, we've had reconstruction, and then we had Jim Crow, right? Then we had civil rights, then we had affirmative, affirmative action, and then we had, um, the recent issues, right? So um, there's this cycle, but thinking about what would it take to um, change society um, permanently. Next, please. Um, you can skip that one. That's just as knowledge producers. I just want to show you an image of a, um, the wellness center, right? We have a physical space. It's in Lincoln Square Mall. And then here is um, um, sea Hearts, a group that I worked with, we had a vision session where we asked people, what does community healing look like to you? And one of, one of the things that came out is that they wanted a space for their young people where they could come, they can, excuse me, feel safe and they can dream and imagine um, whatever they wanted to in terms of their future or in terms of society. So we're waiting um, again until things open up and we do have that space. And there's also a wonderful library with um, different types of books and different languages as well. Um, still part of it, um, we hope to have office hours, right, where faculty, staff, um, administrators will come, also community members come, um, give us their knowledge. We hope to have podcasts. And then also, um, we saw the Hip Hop Express bus that's prepared to make music. We also have a multimedia studio in the Wellness Center too. And then we have a, you, um, oh, I'm sorry, we have a board that says take what you need up here and that's to those little things um, that we can think about that can foster wellness among individuals. Next, please. And you can skip that one. And then we have um, artists in residence. We have scholars in residence. We have artists in residence. And I just want to acknowledge um, our artists and their beautiful um, pieces of work. And the goal is to have Anybody in the community, a child, an adult, faculty, staff, student, anyone who has art that they would like to share with the community, then they, we welcome them to be um, one of our artists in residence. Um, you can go past it. And then the Health Maker Lab, um, we are creating, um, the Health Maker Lab is where you can, um, dream up ideas to foster health and wellness and we have competitions. And so we're also creating a new node um, around designing resiliency and well-being. And the focus will be on social determinants of health, health disparities and health equity. And I think I'm, I'm gonna end there, Lisa. So thank okay. you, thank you. Uh, welcome your questions, comments. You can put them in chat, but you can also um, um, ask directly. We do have some questions. So okay. let me start kind of the first ones that came through Dr. Mendenhall. Mm -hmm. um, someone asked, how can someone get involved with that kind of research that you spoke of? Yeah. Um, trying to see what's the best way. Okay. I'm, I'm going to say for sure. 
so Lisa, they have a contact, right? You, they have a way to contact you and kind of reach. Yes. Yeah, so if if you have any specific questions after today, you can go through the Carl Illinois College of Medicine website, the Reach page, where you would have registered for this webinar. We do have an email address, um, reach at medicine.illinois.edu. Or if you, um, we also encourage you, if you haven't already, to um, sign up for our interest form. So as we have continued um, topics and information for you, we know how to reach you. So feel free to use that email after this webinar. Yes, and, yeah. And um, is this Michael that asked it? Michael, are you a student that's here on campus or? Right, because if you're a student, then it could be through um, like an independent study um, internships. I mean, I, I guess for anyone. So we'll we'll be open. Um, yeah. So okay. she's looking to see. Okay. Yeah. So so we'll be open. As Lisa said, there's um, an email, and um, right, I'm slow with email. I get so much, but Lisa is really good <laughs> with her email. So yeah, make sure check it. you. Say that again. We'll check it oh, if you yes. have anything, and and myself or Dr. Mendenhall can get back to you in detail if if you're looking yeah. for specific opportunities. Yep, yep, and and um, yep, that's what I'll say. Okay. Because there's a lot, there's a lot going on. Yes. Yeah, so another question: What school of medicine did you say helps funds those in financial need? Oh, um, it's um the University of Illinois, and um, I. Th I think it's mostly undergrads. I don't know about the graduate part, but the University of Illinois at Urbana, we started um, the Illinois Commitment, where we um, um, provide free tuition for Illinois residents um, whose parents make under the median income, and I think it's about 67000 but don't quote me on that. It, it's online where you can look for it. So that's the uh, free tuition um program that i talked about yeah and carl illinois college of medicine also has um for medical students um there are scholarships available um something that can be discussed um with our student affairs office great great um next question hi professor mendenhall how is the carl illinois school of medicine engaging with the Champaign-Urbana community with issues of wellness and resiliency? Great, great question. Um, so um, the College of Medicine is working closely with the STEM Illinois um, Public Engagement Program, right, that has the Physical Wellness Center. So that's one of the ways there. But I would say the biggest is probably the Health Maker Lab. And so um, it's, if anyone is listening and they're in the state of Illinois for now, um, you can submit when we have the competition. And when, this, when is the next one, Lisa, in the fall? We'll have it fall 2021? The, the student? 20. One? Nope, the state one. The state one will be next spring. Um, our, the submissions, be, you know, certainly watch for that. Our, the submission um, process will likely open in the fall. It opened in November last year for spring. Yeah, and so anyone with ideas around health and wellness, they submit, it gets judged, and then um, 20 semifinalists are selected where they do a pitch, and we have a dolphin tank, um, which is a kinder, gentler version of Shark Tank, and so they pitch their ideas. Um, we have input from judges, input from the audience, and then we select 10 winners who get $10,000 worth of resources to turn their idea into a prototype, a for-profit, um, organization, non for profit, and then also you get training on patent searches, um, value added, um, just lots of training. And so, um, and the ideas vary. Um, one of them that I'm working with is um, looking to use miniature horses to help children who are at risk or who have been exposed to trauma. And that's Sarah Nixon who's working on that one. And, and um, Okay. Um, and then I and then I should also say the new um, Maker Lab, right, where we hope to work with other healthcare providers and the College of Medicine to do um, community forums to ask about the um, ideas around health and wellness, and really to work closely to work as partners 
um, about how do we address some of some of those issues, and and also with the um, yeah. So I'll I'll say that. Yep. And I'll and I'll just add um, that if you're interested in attending our health makeathon for this year. Mm -hmm. For those of you that may not already know, it was supposed to happen in March, but due to um, the current environment, we had to postpone it and it will be virtual this year. Um, and it will be August 8th, 2020. And you're, you are all welcome to um, tune in as an audience member. We engage the audience members to end part of the voting process and you can see our finalists for this year and the ideas that they came up with. Mm -hmm. um, we have a dolphin tank style, sort of the friendlier version of a shark tank to ask questions of experts um, of the participants. And we do have participants all across the spectrum, community members, students, academics, um, ranging from about age 10 to um, I believe the oldest one is in his late 60s and somewhere in between. So we are very engaged with the community and gathering these ideas and making it a health innovation incubator. Yeah, and also we hope that you see some ideas and it sparks an interest and then in your community, wherever you are, right? You think about, right. well, how can I establish this? How can I go to my local college of medicine? How can I go to the schools? Um, wherever and pull people together to get resources to do something. Yes. And that's a, that's another answer to the question, like, how do we do this? And I think um, as my, I was talking to my brother about something um, with the violence and all things, and he was like, it really is, um, everyone is an expert, right? Like it's, there's such a need that everybody has expertise and can contribute to solving the problem. Right. So the next question from Michael, you mentioned how education, specifically public school education, greatly impacts the success of marginalized or disadvantaged communities. What alternatives to funding our public schools through property taxes, which contribute to the cycle of poverty might exist? In other words, what should we be doing differently when it comes to funding our public schools? Yeah, I think um, that and many people have talked about this before, right? Like breaking the link between property taxes and school funding where schools get um, a, a certain amount, right? A base amount, the same as people are now bringing back into the discussion, this idea of a guaranteed annual income. So also thinking about this idea of schools, um, no matter where they're at, right? Like if they're in um, Winneka, where people can afford to pay high property taxes versus Inglewood, where they can't, that there is still some basic amount of funding that's available. And that basic amount of funding should be what's needed to ensure those students get a quality education. So again, to, to break that link between or alter the link, um, between, break it or alter it. I don't know. I'm not, that's not my specialty area, but between funding and education. Okay. Um, the next question, have you heard of the UC Berkeley, UCSF Black Lives White Coats Initiative, where they propose getting an official diagnosis for the constant stress mm -hmm. that we Black people endure daily because of exposure to racism? They said they hope it will lead to better treatment, allowing Black people time off to cope, etc. What do you think of that? Wow. No, I have not. So, um, Lisa, go back. Let me, let me say it again. So, they're yeah. saying to get an official diagnosis for the constant stress, right? So I know there are conversations around, right, post-traumatic stress and people are um, talking about continuous stress um, and changing that name. So, so is it, are they thinking of using that name or is it another name um, that they're thinking? Can our technology handle that question? Okay, if not, okay, yeah. go ahead to the next one. But um, so what do I think about? It? I think that um, I think that that is really important. So that's a lot of what I'm trying to do, right? To try to understand how all of that stress, you saw the iceberg, right? How all of those things underneath it um, accumulate and how they break the body down so that you do see the plane full of blacks falling out the sky, the plane, you know, other groups. Um, with these um, high um, levels of comor 
comorbidity and then um, early death. So I, I think that's really important. I think it's really important. Okay, um, next question. Good afternoon, Dr. Mendenhall. So nice to share the space with you. How did you decide to focus on the women yeah. of Wood and how did you recruit them? Yeah. I would like to do similar research myself regarding low income black women, but I'm um, unaware of how to gather those participants as a college student myself. Yeah, so, um, oh man, do I remember how we started in Inglewood? I know that we started, well, we did the South Side, right? And I think like a lot of, either a lot, of, oh, I know, I know. Um, one of my professors was doing a lot of, um, at Phil Bowman, well, wonderful, wonderful professor that I had at Northwestern, was doing a lot of work in Inglewood and working with policymakers. And I think um, that that was part of it. And I remember uh, Professor Bowman, when I was first starting to think about and go into the community, and he was like, but you got to remember one thing, right? Like you have to go in there and you have to ask questions. Don't think that you're an expert. Um, you have to listen and see what they're doing. And then he said, um, and, if, and when you see a lot of problems, you also have to look for the high levels of resiliency because it's already there, right? People will try to um, maximize the resources that they have to survive and thrive. And then um, Glenn Elder, right? He has a theory, life course theory, and um, agency is a big part of that. And then Phil Bowman um, talks about role strain and adaptation. So I think that's how I um, got interested in Inglewood. And I would say, I mean, if you're at a college, right, like um, um, you have an ecosystem. So I would look on the web um, either at your college or even nearby colleges of people who may be doing research in this area. Um, and even, again, you can email um, Lisa and then Lisa and I can talk and then we can get um, maybe some names back to you. But definitely think about um, your faculty that's in your college, nearby colleges, or even um, at hospitals and maybe volunteering or um, a lot of communities, they have community organizations who would love to have um, interns or other people work with them. So, so it really is a, a wide range of um, ways that you can get started. And, and I would suggest too, I mean, you're thinking about this already, right? To, to look and see what others are doing and then maybe to build upon that. Okay, Dr. Mendenhall, we have about seven minutes. We've got several questions here, so. Okay, so, so be quick again, Lisa. <laughs> no, I just wanna get through as many as we can. We got some great <laughs> questions. Okay. Um, as a future physician, from a care perspective, how do you see us using this knowledge to offer more equitable, equitable care to patients of all backgrounds? Yes, so, um, I mean, I, I think one, one oh, okay, I've gotta be short. Um, I think one thing is to, have an appreciation for that iceberg and understanding that when someone comes in with headaches, backaches, stomach aches, right? Like to um, think about, right, that thing where I said, why, what's happening, what's happening, what's happening, and breaking it down, right? Do they have enough money, right? If children are coming in failing to thrive instead of um, the protective service team and, oh, do we need to take the baby out of the home, kind of looking and listening and seeing if economic issues are a part of it, if racism is a part of it, and trying to think about those social determinants of health and trying to address issues of health equity. So I would say that in a nutshell. Okay. Does the Carl Illinois College of Medicine offer any dual degree programs with public health? Yeah, from my knowledge, we don't. We're talking about um, MDs, PhDs, but Lisa, are we talking about like with public health? Not right now with public health. There yeah. is obviously on campus there is a public health degree um, through the you know graduate college that could be pursued, but not a dual specific dual program today. Yeah, but but um, I would say if that's something you're interested in, like talk to talk to us, talk to the administrators, and see like um, there should be some way that um, increased public health information about public health can be worked into your um, um, yes. training, right? We have discovery yeah. classes. We have other times when you can um, go and get more in-depth knowledge. So um, although we may not have a formal dual degree, there are certainly um, opportunities for you to get more information and training in public health. 
Um, what do you recommend for students that are not in Illinois? How, do, how can we participate virtually or anything at all to gain some experience? Yeah, so um, I mean, I think COVID-19 has really kind of pushed many of us online and thinking about a broader community, which, which I'd like. So um, for that one, you can um, email us too. And again, if something doesn't work out here, we'll try to think about like what's in your space. So let us know like where you're at and um, we can kind of think about some things, but, but we're gonna try to have some virtual um, meetings and virtual think and do tanks and all of that. Okay, with the cycle of systemic violence that comes from a lack of funding, which leads to a lack of education, which leads to many more issues, how should we stop the cycle and create change within black and non-white communities that face this oppression? It just seems daunting and I don't necessarily know where to start. Mm -hmm. um, from a lack of funding. So, so this is what I would say, and, and it's many answers to that question though, but I would, in terms of this idea of feeling daunt, feeling like it's so much, right? That, that's why I put the mountain in, and like I said, my hand is up because some, some days I feel it, right? And, and it, it causes me to cry. It causes me to, um, to have all kinds of emotions, and especially when I have to talk to my black boys about um, how to act with police, right? So I would say maybe to start with something that you feel that you're passionate about and maybe connecting with others who are doing um, something in that area. And that way you have a support group. And, um, and, then, and then I would say really to, to, really, be, to really think big um, at the Carl Illinois College of Medicine with the Health Makeathon and other areas, we really do try to think about audacious, bold things and, um, and then do a little bit of that. I'm even finding some of my bold, outrageous things that I've imagined, like I see them playing out, like the wellness center, right? Like I, I've talked about wanting a wellness center. There's a TEDx talk, you can um, Google it and you'll see me talking about it. But at the time I didn't have a dime, right, for, the, for anything and now there is one. So I would say find your passion, um, work with people, and, um, and don't, don't feel like even if you're doing a little bit at a time that that's not making a difference. And, and that's my kind of short answer. Okay. okay. How do we ensure that the medical schools we are looking at will be giving us an education that will promote learning how diversity affects health? Yeah, um, I mean, that, that's a good one. And, and um, we're trying to, um, deal with that now as well. One thing that the Car Illinois College of Medicine has is um, medical humanities as one of the pillar stones. And so our students are getting training around ethics and um, other issues around race and health disparities. So you can, when you um, talk to medical schools, when you look on their website, you can see what they're doing, and even if they aren't, if it's a medical school that you um, really like, it's close, it's, um, you know, there are people there doing what you want to do, you can ask them, um, have they thought about having these classes? Or you can say, right, like, you know, these classes are really important to have. And one thing we have to be careful, both in um, the um, academy and medical schools, is about putting a lot of that labor on students, right? Like, these are things that we should have in place. The infrastructure should be there, right? We're not um, in Jim Crow South or Jim Crow US, kind of. Um, so, right, like we should have um, systems, classes, and things like that in place where it's, it's a given, right? If you're being trained to take care of individuals that you understand about race and ability status and all those things that I listed around intersectionality. Okay, I think we have time for one more short question. Um, if we didn't get to your question, we will try and do sort of an FAQ out on our website for anything um, that was asked today. So hopefully we can get all your questions answered. Um, Dr. Mendenhall, for the last one, we'll say, from an administering care perspective, how can a doctor best use the knowledge of these disparities to offer more equitable care? Oh, that's a good one. Hmm. I mean, I think, and, and this goes back again to my experience at Cook County Hospital. 
Um, I think as you're in the meetings and you're discussing um, the type of care that's given, protective service, um, I mean, all of it to have the people that you serve a part of those conversations, to have them in the meetings. And I know that that is a disruption of how meetings are usually held. Um, but I think that it's important to hear their voices. Like I said, one thing we're gonna to try to do is to have these forums where we ask, so, so what do you need in the community? Um, even one of the hospitals is interesting, saying specifically for our hospital, when you come through it as an individual, um, what, what things work, what things can we do better? And I think that those are important um, questions. And then of course, the training of um, all of the staff so that they understand it and that they understand the big old fashioned racism, but that they also understand the more subtle things that still make people feel uncomfortable, still make people uncomfortable to call or to, to spend time in that space. So I would say one, to involve um, the community, the people who are receiving your service and really having a sense of what they need and then training um, faculty, staff, and um, medical students about how to interact and even how to read um, when someone may have been offended and how to repair that. That's what I'll say. Okay, so we're at an hour. So thank you everybody for attending today. Dr. Menenhall, did you have any last thoughts before thank we? Yeah, so um, again, thank you. And um, right, I know that there's a lot going on, so we appreciate it. And that we do, I mean, I, um, any questions that I didn't get to, please um, email Lisa or you know, go through the website. We'll really try to address them. And then we'll also try to think about um, like the forum, because I do think it's important to um, use the collective wisdom that's out there. So there were some really great questions here. Um, and then also other suggestions that you have for us, feel free to let us know that as well. But thank you, thank you. Thank you everybody for attending today. Thank Bye. you.